Hello, this is uh, Eric Ruderman. I'm a professor of medicine in the Division of Rheumatology at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. And I want to welcome you to this program, Ankylosing Spondylitis Highlights for 2011. I'm going to cover a number of uh, abstracts that were presented at the most recent American College of Rheumatology scientific meeting, as well as uh, some important papers published within the last year uh, dealing with the issue of ankylosing spondylitis and its management. Uh, I've divided the uh, program into several sections. I'm going to talk about uh, therapy, uh, speak a little bit about epidemiology and some management issues, and then uh, finish up with some discussion of uh, some issues in disease progression that I think uh, have become more important recently and are beginning to gel a bit. Uh, so let's uh, jump right in and start with therapy. Um, a number of years ago, uh, there began to be an effort to sort of refine the standard criteria for ankylosing spondylitis. The uh, criteria that have been used since uh, the early 80s were the modified New York criteria, a consensus criteria that identified uh, both clinical and radiographic findings that were consistent with ankylosing spondylitis. In order to be defined as ankylosing spondylitis, uh, patients had to have at least two of the clinical criteria, which included uh, low back pain, uh, limitation of uh, motion in the lumbar spine, and limitation of chest expansion, as well as radiographic evidence of sacroiliitis on a plain x-ray. The problem with these criteria uh, over the years has been that uh, people have recognized that there are many patients who manifest inflammatory back pain, basically ankylosing spondylitis, but do not have x-ray changes. Uh, the addition of new imaging techniques, including CT scans and MRI, uh, have helped with this uh, and have given us the ability to identify uh, radiographic findings uh, perhaps before they show up on a plain x-ray. Uh, and this led to a concept uh, of what, has, what was known as a pre-radiographic axial spondyl arthropathy. In other words, uh, patients with what was presumed to be ankylosing spondylitis uh, but had symptoms before they manifested uh, plain radiographic evidence of disease. Uh, and the um, figure on this slide uh, sort of shows that uh, continuum from the development of back pain uh, to the development of radiographic findings and eventually syndesmophytes and represents ankylosing spondylitis on this spectrum. This led to some uh, pilot studies uh, beginning to look at uh, this type of diagnosis uh, for treatment, and I'm showing you here a, an older study uh, from about four years ago that was just a small study uh, looking at the use of uh, adalimumab in treating this so-called pre-radiographic axial spinal arthropathy. In the last couple of years, that concept have ch has changed some, and there has now been a recognition that there are patients with uh, inflammatory back pain and what is presumed to be axial spinal arthritis who may never actually manifest uh, plain radiographic changes. Uh, and it's also become clear that many of these patients are, sim are just as uh, impacted by their disease as patients with true ankylosing spondylitis meeting criteria. And this led to the ASAS working group um, within the last couple of years developing new criteria for axialos ankylosing uh, spondylitis, or in this case, axial spinal arthritis, uh, as shown on this slide. Uh, and what they suggested uh, is that patients who have sacroiliitis on imaging, and this can be any imaging, either MRI uh, or CT, as well as a plain film, uh, or patients who have a, a positive HLA-B27 antigen, along with other features of spinal arthropathy, uh, in the setting of persistent low back pain, uh, can be diagnosed with axial spinal arthropathy. They also recommended that the same uh, criteria and recommendations for use of TNF inhibitors in ankylosing spondylitis could now be applied to these patients with axial spinal arthropathy. And this, this really opens up uh, the door to uh, more aggressive treatment of patients who simply aren't responding to non-steroidals. And so the same uh, recommendations apply. A patient who has failed uh, two different non-steroidals uh, should be considered as a potential candidate for a TNF inhibitor, even in the absence of a trial of an oral DMARD, uh, which uh, have not been shown to be effective in axial disease and spinal arthropathies, though there is some evidence that they are of value in uh, peripheral disease, as I'll actually discuss in a minute or two. All of that is by way of background uh, to an interesting uh, abstract that was presented at the ACR meeting this year on the ABILITY-1 trial. And this was a study, uh, the first large study of a TNF inhibitor, in this case adalimumab, in patients who meet these new criteria for non-radiographic axial spondyloarthropathy. 
So these were patients who met this criteria but did not, in fact, meet the modified New York criteria for ankylosing spondylitis, which uh, means that they did not have radiographic evidence of sacroiliitis in most cases. They also had to have active disease with a BASDI score at least four, uh, back pain, and had to have been uh, an inadequate responder to a non steroidal anti inflammatory. Uh, and what you see quite clearly is that adalimumab was uh, significantly more effective than placebo. And indeed, the response rates in this trial are very comparable to the types of response rates that have been seen with uh, other TNF inhibitors as well as adalimumab. Uh, in uh, actual ankylosing spondylitis meeting those criteria. Uh, in addition, they looked uh, more, uh, in more detail uh, in a sub-analysis, and it turned out that younger patients, those patients with an elevated C-reactive protein at baseline, were more likely to respond. And this, in fact, uh, mirrors what has been seen in ankylosing spondylitis as well, where patients with an elevated C-reactive protein are more likely to respond. In a separate abstract at the ACR meeting, um, there was a report on uh, patient-reported outcomes in this particular trial, and this was really interesting because it looked uh, at functional and work outcomes uh, and suggested uh, that these patients were uh, just as functionally impaired at baseline as patients with uh, clear-cut ankylosing spondylitis, and that this could be improved uh, with the use of a TNF inhibitor, again, in this case, adalimumab. Uh, and you see from the table uh, that uh, HAC scores improved with adalimumab relative to placebo. Uh, the physical component uh, of the SF36 improved relative to placebo. And a number of the elements of work, uh, including absenteeism uh, and total activity impairment, uh, improved relative to placebo. Uh, presenteeism, that is a measure of being at work but not being fully functional, uh, was not statistically improved, but this may have been uh, due to the size of the trial when you look at the uh, clear difference in the numbers between uh, adalimumab and placebo in this trial. Uh, moving on, I want to talk about uh, a couple of other outcome or treatment studies that actually were published within the past year, uh, not uh, studies that were actually presented at the ACR meeting. The first is a study of high-dose etanercept in ankylosing spondylitis. Um, there is uh, significant literature uh, looking at dosing of TNF inhibitors in a number of diseases, uh, including rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis. And this is the first uh, study to look at the possibility of increasing the dose of a tannercept in ankylosing spondylitis uh, to see if there was any additional benefit. Uh, and much like a previously published study in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, there was not. Uh, indeed, 50 milligrams given twice weekly uh, was no more effective in ankylosing spondylitis than 50 milligrams given once weekly, uh, although interestingly, there were no safety differences between the two uh, treatment regimens in this trial. In the previously published rheumatoid arthritis trial, there was a suggestion of more infections in the higher dose treatment group. Another paper um, published within the past year and one that I uh, referenced a bit earlier uh, was one that compared etanercept and sulfasalazine in ankylosing spondylitis. Um, the ASAS recommendations from a few years ago suggested that uh, disease-modifying drugs were not uh, necessary as a prerequisite uh, to putting patients on TNF inhibitors uh, who had failed uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory arthritis, except for patients who had peripheral disease, uh, in which it was suggested that sulfasalazine might be beneficial. And this was one of the first uh, large studies that looked at this. This was actually a fairly large study with uh, over 500 patients who were randomized to receive uh, either a Tanercept 50 milligrams weekly or sulfasalazine uh, dosed up to 3 grams daily. The primary endpoint uh, was the ASAS 20 uh, at week 16, and you can see uh, on this uh, slide uh, that a Tanercept was somewhat more effective than sulfasalazine, although the other thing I think I take home from this study is that there were a significant number of patients who had a response to sulfasalazine, uh, and I think that in uh, patients with uh, peripheral disease uh, who are reticent uh, to go on a TNF inhibitor, or perhaps in patients with a uh, history of infections or other uh, potential uh, confounders that uh, might uh, suggest to a physician not to use a TNF inhibitor, that sulfasalazine might be uh, a reasonable alternative choice or at least one to try. And finally, uh, the last study on, uh, that I want to cover in terms of treatment, uh, at least existing treatments, is one here that I found quite interesting that looked at the use of physical therapy 
uh, in ankylosing spondylitis patients. Um, we are all, uh, as clinicians, quite familiar with the benefit of TNF inhibitors uh, in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. And this was a very interesting study that looked at whether uh, adding physical therapy could provide even additional benefit uh, to the dramatic response we see with a TNF inhibitor? Uh, the simple answer was yes. They took uh, 62 patients, uh, randomized them into three groups, one of which received no additional therapy, or one of which uh, received uh, education, which consisted of several uh, group meetings, uh, and one of which received education uh, plus physical therapy. And you can see from the table that the group that got uh, physical therapy improved significantly relative to the group that got no additional treatment beyond a TNF inhibitor in a number of areas, including uh, pain, stiffness, fatigue, uh, function, and mobility. And I think there's an important take-home here uh, that suggests that uh, when we treat patients with a TNF inhibitor for their ankylosing spondylitis, we're not done, and we need to look at uh, other potential adjunctive therapies, including physical therapy. The last treatment thing I want to cover quite briefly uh, is a, another paper published within the last year uh, on the use of abatacept in ankylosing spondylitis. For patients with AS who have failed uh, TNF inhibitors, we struggle to look for other potential therapies, uh, and there is uh, obvious interest in other biologic therapies. Uh, this open-label trial quite simply showed that there was really very limited uh, benefit uh, with the use of abatacept at standard doses, either in uh, TNF-naive patients uh, or more particularly in TNF failure patients where we, we would be looking for another option. And so I think, unfortunately, uh, this confirms some uh, previous anecdotal evidence that this is uh, not a, a useful option in this uh, situation. Let's move on briefly to epidemiology and management. Um, I want to touch on uh, the first slide here, which is a, a paper published in the past year looking at pregnancy and ankylosing spondylitis. It's a small series, and I think there are some issues with the way uh, the study was done, but this was a case-controlled study in which they mailed out questionnaires uh, to uh, 19 women who had had 35 pregnancies who all met New York criteria for ankylosing spondylitis. The comparator group uh, was a group of women with psoriasis. Uh, in the AS patients, about half of them reported an improvement in pain, particularly in the first trimester. Uh, pain improved more than stiffness, and interestingly, there were no flares in their psoriasis, their uveitis, their peripheral arthritis, or any uh, symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, they also noted the pain tended to increase at three and then particularly six months postpartum, uh, but these women did not flare uh, above their level of pre-pregnancy pain. Uh, one of the uh, flaws in this particular paper was they did not have any mention of medication, so we don't really know what these uh, women were treated with either during or after their pregnancy. But I think the take home here is something that many of us have seen in clinical practice, and that is that uh, the experience of uh, disease in AS uh, during pregnancy is similar to what we've seen in rheumatoid arthritis, and the patients improve while pregnant and then flare again uh, when they deliver. I want to briefly look at this uh, slide, which is an abstract from the ACR meeting this year. Uh, which uh, simply looked uh, at the large uh, Swedish database where they're able to compare uh, their database of ankylosing spondylitis patients, and in this case, uh, psoriatic arthritis patients as well, uh, with the uh, cancer database. They looked here for lymphoma, and uh, the message was quite simple. Uh, looking overall from 1969 through 2007, and then specifically at the time period between 2001 and 2007, uh, when TNF inhibitors were more widely used in Sweden, there was no increase in risk for lymphoma in patients with AS or psoriatic arthritis, and this is uh, in distinction to what we've seen in rheumatoid arthritis in the same uh, Swedish databases. Uh, last thing I want to cover on uh, epidemiology is the issue of referral. Uh, this was an interesting paper uh, presented actually not at the ACR meeting but at the ULAR meeting within the past year that looked at uh, identifying patients with spinal arthropathy, in many cases ankylosing spondylitis in primary care, something we struggle with uh, as rheumatologists trying to make sure our primary care colleagues refer patients appropriately. This was a multinational study that looked at uh, two different referral strategies for primary care physicians. One was to simply tell them if you had a patient with inflammatory back pain, uh, a positive HLA-B27 or sacroiliitis on x-ray, uh, refer those patients to a rheumatologist, and you can see uh, from the table uh, 
that about a third of those patients ultimately had an axial spinal arthropathy uh, diagnosed by the rheumatologist. A second strategy added family history and uh, potential response to a non and this didn't really add any additional uh, benefit in terms of identifying patients with axial spinal arthropathy. Um, perhaps more importantly, it turned out that in this large study, uh, imaging and uh, B27 testing was rarely done, and so ultimately it was really inflammatory back pain that drove referral to the rheumatologist uh, and it suggests that this could be a very simple uh, tool to get out there to primary care with. And if, they, if we can get them to identify young patients with three months of an inflammatory uh, back pain, uh, and a significant proportion of those patients are going to have a true spinal arthropathy that can use our help, uh, and that's a uh, sort of referral guideline that may be very helpful for them. Let me finish up here uh, with the last couple slides on disease progression, and I'll uh, start with this cartoon. This is an evolving issue that has been looking at um, exactly how do patients progress with ankylosing spondylitis, what drives formation of syndesmophytes and ultimately ankylosis. And there is a sense that uh, patients can develop inflammation at the antheses uh, at the corners of their vertebrae. Sometimes this inflammation can resolve. Other times it can progress to fatty infiltration in those areas and then ultimately to new bone formation. Um, it's believed that TNF inhibitors may work by reducing that inflammation, but this doesn't always reduce the progression to fat infiltration and ultimately new bone formation. And in fact, uh, the experience with uh, TNF inhibitors at uh, reducing progression of disease in the spine and ankylosing spondylitis uh, has been uniformly uh, uh, un unhelpful, and, and these drugs have not seemed to uh, prevent progression. Uh, on the other hand, there are other potential targets that may do the same. If we look at the next slide, a paper that was presented at the ACR meeting, uh, this was a long-term look at a very small number of patients, and that's important to recognize. These were only 22 patients who had been on infliximab for eight years. And I think the interesting thing you can see on the graph is that for the first four years or so, compared to a historical control population, there was really no change in radiographic progression in the spine uh, as measured by the modified SASSS score, which is basically a radiographic scoring system for spine. Uh, but again, in this small study, there was a hint that after four years, from four to eight years, the two curves began to separate, suggesting that over a long period of time, uh, treatment with a TNF inhibitor may eventually reduce early inflammation and have some impact on long-term progression of disease. Uh, this is a story that uh, still needs writing, and we still need to learn more about this, um, but it does suggest that perhaps with long-term treatment, we may see additional benefit besides just symptomatic benefit. The last abstract I want to talk about, though, was a, another interesting abstract from the ACR meeting that looked at the use of non-steroidals. Uh, and there has been some suggestion, uh, both uh, at meetings and, in fact, in published papers, that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, in, in distinction to TNF inhibitors, may actually have an impact on radiograph regression in AS uh, by preventing that new bone formation. This was a small study in which uh, patients who were already on a TNF inhibitor uh, were divided into patients who had persistent symptoms and required continued use of an NSAID versus those patients whose symptoms improved and who discontinued their NSAIDs. They are, were comparable in many ways, including their uh, age at diagnosis, their function and uh, uh, mobility at baseline, uh, although the uh, group that was taking NSAIDs had higher BASDI scores, which is not surprising because that's why they continue to take their NSAIDs. Uh, when you look at the two graphs, What's clear is that in the group who uh, added and, and stayed on their NSAID with their biologic, uh, they had much less progression in their radiographic scoring over the year of follow-up as compared to the group who were simply on a biologic. Small study, and I don't know that this is the final answer, but it does suggest that uh, other agents, in this case an NSAID, in addition to a biologic, may be of some value in prevent preventing progression in this disease, and I think this is something we need to continue to look at. Um, that's the uh, last abstract I wanted to go through with you today. I appreciate uh, your time listening to this, and uh, I hope this information has been valuable as we've looked at the uh, highlights in ankylosing spondylitis in 2011.